And when you think about those virtues of love and integrity and truth and excellence in relationships has to be anchored to a moral compass that we know comes from Jesus, but yet we have worked over time to altogether remove them. What do we say, family? Welcome to Simplexity, a little podcast. We take seemingly complex matters and attempt to make them plain and simple. My name is Sammy Foster. Join with the one and only Boots. How are you? I'm good. Good. And join with the one and only Mr. Sigvel Berg. How you doing, friend? Hey, I'm doing great, and I'm glad to be with you guys today. Hmm. So great to have you here. This is a, uh, an episode I've looked forward to for some time now because, um, if you recall, I'm going to jog the memory of our listeners, viewers, that is that uh, it was about a year ago? Was is it, it safe long? to say a year ago back? Yeah, could be. That we had SIG on, wherein we had technical difficulties, hmm. um, where we were only able to release the audio portion of, yes. and... Um, and here's the interesting thing about that. When we had you on, you were in the foreground of really the release of a book that you've since released. Actually, yes. I had an advanced copy of, come on somebody, but yet you had just finished writing it and then um, it had gone through editing and you were really courting publishers at the time. Right. And from then to now, you have since released the book of which I hold in the hand. And I think I got an advanced copy of this too. <laughs> really? <laughs> of which you have entitled The Virtue Proposition. And I just want to say it is an absolutely wonderful, um, illuminating, educational read that uh, I'm greatly grateful for. Thank you. You've read it too, have I you? I have, read? and I'm greatly grateful as well. <laughs> now listen. I want to sort of set this up by way of the virtue proposition is in many ways, um, it's a comprising of so much of the curriculum, coaching, um, mentoring of leaders that you've given your life to yep. that I was a beneficiary of. You and I spent about a year together where yes. you were my mentor, coached, walked me through these virtues, if you will. Um, and in so many ways, this book is is sort of your life's work. Is that accurate? Yeah, I, th I think that's probably a good description of it. Um, there are a lot of things as I look back in my life I wish I would have done differently. Um, but I've had a lot of experiences, a lot of mentoring uh, along the way, people who recognized there were things that I needed to work on. Uh, and there still are a number of things for me to still work on. And so I think the genesis of the book itself, uh, the movie Schindler's List, uh, there's a scene where Oscar Schindler is standing in a rail yard near the end of his time in Germany, and he's standing with a group of his employees, all Jews who he saved uh, from the Holocaust in many ways, mm. from the Nazis. And they give him a ring in that closing scene, and... Uh, He's touched by it, obviously. And then the camera changes a little bit. It's dark. There's a special lighting. <laughs> Rain's coming down. He's standing in the back of his car. And he looks at the group, and he thinks for a moment, and he starts to weep, saying, I could have done, I could have done so much more if I had only known. <clears throat> in many ways, I see my life in the same way. There are things that if I had only known earlier or experiences that I have had that I too could have done so much more. And so the genesis of the book is to lay out some of that um, with good background, uh, academically sound, experientially proven, mm. uh, but at the same time hoping that people will begin to pick that up and be able to apply it a lot earlier than I did. And the book itself is also the basis uh, of a program that we have started in Annapolis called the Severin Leadership Group, where we help people begin to discover who they are, what they're about, 
and what it means for wherever they work or whatever they do. So good. And so uh, that combination is can we really develop the kind of people who can make a difference in the world and do so feeling um, a sense of uh, humility, uh, but at the same time, a, a fullness of life they may not have known otherwise. You know, uh, it's, it's one of the many things that I, I love about you and that I appreciate so much in that n not only is this book theologically rooted because you are a Jesus follower, but I think it's safe to say that anyone, and I, and I say that, that any intentionally, um, anyone that was to peer into the life of Sig Berg, um, knowing uh, just the educational background that you've had, the career highs that you've experienced, your military involvement, you have your MDiv, um, uh, pastored for decades, um, have started a leadership program that really influences, you know, high tier people. Most people would look into your life and say, he's lived a full life. He's lived a robust life, an influential life. Yet you never describe yourself as such. Yeah, you true. always describe yourself as, I'm still learning, I'm still growing, I'm still a student, I still want to experience, I still got a lot under the hood that I want to pour out. And, um, and that inspires me, friend. That inspires me that you're not done and that you're always looking over the horizon of, Lord, what more do you have in store for me? But, but before you speak to that, what I want Boots to do is I just want him to read Wave Tops because the last episode we let reread the entire bio mm. of Zig, and yet it took about half the episode. It was eight pages long. <laughs> Well, not quite that long. <laughs> but you Double do space. the honor okay. of reading the bio as it's currently written. Look at that picture. Handsome. 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 Um, before I read it, I do just want to say, when it comes to like the, uh, the Schindler's List analogy, mm. what I think is most encouraging to me personally as you share that is it doesn't feel like it's cloaked in regret. Yeah. necessarily it, it feels wow. more so like it's cloaked in an excitement for the future and there there's That's still true. more work to be done there's Absolutely. still more people to empower or to energize um i don't know i because i feel like that could be a a hard balance to strike but well i might just add you know add one other thing people who've known me for a long time would say okay i picked up the book i got it but what I see in the book is not what I knew you about 30 <laughs> years ago. You weren't like that. Yeah. Or in some aspects you weren't. And my answer is, well, I have to say that's true. Yeah. Uh. But over the time, hopefully, I've been able to grow, to learn, uh, to progress a little bit. Absolutely. And I still have a lot of things to work on and a lot of people hammering on me to get better along the way. <laughs> I'm forever grateful for all of them. So it's a never-ending journey. Amen. And uh, the best is yet to come. Mm. Come on. I love well, it. Well, I'd like to meet these people who knew you 30 years ago because <laughs> I feel like they wouldn't say that. I feel like they would look at this and be like, there, yeah, there were, uh, it's been a long journey for there were, There were acorns there. Um, okay, so let me read this. Sigberg is chairman and founder of the Severn Leadership Group, SLG in Annapolis, Maryland, which for over a decade has influenced the character of leadership across a variety of industries, government and the armed forces, just as Berg has done his whole career. He has been a nuclear submarine commander in the U.S. Navy and held executive and educational positions in the nuclear industry. It's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's not gloss over that one. Berg has a Master of Divinity degree from Trinity Lutheran Seminary and has served as a church pastor. He has also taken part in the Advanced Management Program from Harvard Business School. Come on, somebody. Berg's passion, as shown through SLG and the Virtue Proposition, is to create a space for catalyzing transcendent, virtuous cultures that accelerate team performance and multiply their impact. Mm. So... Um, if that doesn't make you want to read this, I don't know what will. Yeah, right. Over to you, sir. So here's where I wanna I wanna before we get into some of the content found therein, 
Uh, I want to jump off by saying that I, I recently had an experience that was delightful. Wherein, um, this past Sunday, my family and I went to the United States Naval Academy to be part of the church service there in the, the Naval Academy chapel. And Pastor Sig, you preached. Yes. And um, I got to say, you know, even my son and I, we compared notes just uh, about just how refreshing that service was. Now, it's considerably different than Lighthouse, whereas we being non-denominational are a lot more charismatic, expressive. We create margin, a little more free-flowing. Casual. Casual. Well said. Um, this was a little more formal, much more traditional, much more orthodox, wherein the, uh, the audience and the congregation fits the bill. That said, one of the things that I so appreciated about your sermon is that it not only was compelling and engaging, you were sharp, you, you, you didn't mince words, but yet you were provoking to a degree yeah. to the traditional sort of could be argued somewhat stoic congregation as to somewhat jar them to really get them to consider this idea about being a Christian. And off the jump, you asked a question, and then you led by saying that really this day and age, when it comes to being a Christian or carrying that label or identifying as, um, it has almost altogether lost its weight. It does not mean what it once did, and moreover, it's arguably confusing. Like when you say in 2024, I'm a Christian, people are left to wonder, do you mean that by way of political affiliation? Do you mean that according to the party that you align with or an iconic figure that is known as a Christian? And what exactly does that, does that mean? And you spoke to that. And one of the things that you really sort of spoke to was this idea of Christianity doesn't mean what it once did because we have lost our sense of virtue. We've lost the underpinning that makes a Christian a Christian. And you spoke to these virtues, naturally, that you wrote about, um, that should be the nucleus, if you will, planted by the work of the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, but really, it's these virtues are what were taught us by our Messiah and really given us at the new birth of a surrendered life to Jesus. Um, and then you went on to unpack those. I found that so profound because I think we live in a day and age where there's a lot of conversation and confusion around Christians and around this idea of being a disciple, follower of Jesus, that we're left to wonder, well, how do we get back to our roots? How do we get back to a New Testament believer? How do we get back to what it was supposed to be about? And yet you, in many ways, answer that. Well, I think as we take a look at it, the issue is what is our moral foundation? Mm. Now, I'm not talking about Christianity uh, in this case as a moral set of codes, but rather who are we and what is at, at the foundation of who we are? As Christians, we'd say Jesus certainly is at the center of that, yes. But how does that magnify itself? How is it seen? And so I, I talk about we need an inner, we, we're meant to have an inner compass mm. that as we live life, our words and the way we act and our character in the world are the same. Hmm. And often now we say one thing and do something else. Right. And so what is at the basis of our lives um, and our calling as people in the world? You know, and, and you said, you know, these virtues, they're timeless and they're transcendent. Yes. Meaning it's not new virtues for 2024 that are different from those of antiquity, if you will. Uh, those that were found in the New Testament believers should be the same virtues that we adopt, cherish, and champion 
in this present day. And you, you sort of speak to this as not just as followers of Jesus, but these virtues are essential for families, for leaders, for corporations, for relationships, for the fabric of society, for any healthy, growing, developing culture. These virtues are not negotiable. They're absolutely essential. Yeah, and they, they are sort of baked into the creation mm. from the very beginning. Now, they're talked about in different ways. The philosophers uh, have a set of virtues which are compatible. Uh, and religious traditions have virtues. Uh, they, they may be spoken about in different kinds of ways. But they're transcendent. They're baked in. They're forever there. Mm. And they're meant to be a part of the creation we live in. And so the ones that I have written about and spoken about are based, and we, when you have a virtue, what's the foundation for it? Mm. It'll either come out of the philosophic community or the religious community. I've chosen the religious community, and I have so chosen Jesus as the source of the virtues I talk about. Why Jesus and not someone else? I chose Jesus because of not only what he said when he was here, but how he behaved and what he did. Mm. Those combinations. Philosophers will often talk about virtues, but you don't see the behaviors with it. And that's what's unique about Jesus. The two of them come together. And so they're timeless and transcendent. For all people, regardless of who you are, they are sort of the compass that, that sends us north and not around the world in crazy ways. So, with no further ado, mm. my dear friend, what are those virtues? There are five virtues. And they're best described by the word leader. Mm. Love, uh. integrity, truth, excellence, and relationships. Let me basically outline them in a very quick way. Love. Love is not a feeling, mm. but it is a commitment to serve others before self. And it's to care about others, understand others, seek to know what, what, what's up with them in many ways. And then there's a flip side of that. Uh, and the flip side is tough love. Mm. where we may need to say tough things along the way. We often think of the former that I just talked about, right. but there is the other half of it. That's love. The second is integrity. Uh, in short form, uh, it's that we live our lives wherever we are in whatever role we're in, in the same way. Mm. Whether it's private, whether it's in darkness, whether it's in, uh, with our family, whether it's at work, whether it's at the ballpark, we're consistent in the way we live. Or to put it this way, our talk and walk match. Wow. In other words, we walk Absolutely. the talk. And a lot of people will say one thing, and then a half hour later, you see their behaviors doing something different. Absolutely. So integrity. So it's love, integrity. Next is truth. And I think this is always the search for the facts, the issues of what's really going on. And then how do you put that together to, to better understand of where we are? Or to put it this way, when I often talk about truth, it's truth about myself. If you stand in front of a mirror, hmm. what do you really see? And you're willing to admit, uh, I may not what I would like to see in the mirror. Uh, I'm somebody else much deeper. Hmm cast off some of that stuff. So it's truth about yourself and a real truth about the world we live in, what's going on. And unfortunately, these days, there's just chaos in so many places, not only in this country, but around the world. Love, integrity, truth, excellence. Now, excellence is another word that's tossed around with all kinds of meanings. And uh, excellence is not success. Mm. It's not perfection. But excellence, on the other hand, is seeking to continue to grow, to get better, to improve, to move toward who you really are designed to be. And it's a lifelong journey. Mm. It's not going to happen overnight, but it's constant movement forward. Uh, at the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations, there's a table where someone has uh, carved into the words, the words excellence. 
there's a guy chiseling away still on one of the letters. Mm. It's never finished. I love that. As we move forward. Love, integrity, truth, excellence, and then relationships. Life is about relationships. Mm. Relationships with God. Relationships with our friends. Relationships at work. Uh, in many ways, it's about emotional intelligence. What's really going on? How are people feeling mm. uh, in the sense of uh, getting to know them, getting to understand them? And so um, relationships are at the bottom of the basis for life. And I think coming out of a technical community, you can spend so much time on the technical piece right. and forget the people. And I talk to so many people these days, particularly those in the thir their 30s, huh. where they're a part of a team but it's not really a team. It's nine individuals who come and go, maybe a boss who's a narcissist uh, or out for himself or herself. Um, it, there's something wrong. Absolutely. And so it's important that we take a look at this business of relationships. But there's one other that I don't include as a virtue. Come on. And that's courage. And C.S. Lewis says it well. Courage appears always at the testing point of every virtue. Mm. So every virtue that we put into place, uh, it, there's courage to it. And I would argue it's not just once that you do these things, but every day in small kinds of ways. And they're not seen as a single piece, but they're intermingled, two or three at a time, or maybe all of them. And some we're better off at it at a given time in our life, and others uh, we better keep working on more. So I'm always working on, on one of the virtues in my own life. I've got a lot of work yet still to do. <laughs> Can I ask a, a question? Shoot. Ooh, he was ready. <laughs> um, so as you were walking through those virtues, um, since I have had the pleasure of reading the book, I was kind of trying to think through what would it look like to have courage um, be the catalyst with this virtue. And some of it felt more self-evident than some of the other ones. Um, so I was wondering if you could give a practical example of what courage looks like in the context of, let's just say, relationships. Yeah, and I think, Great first question. of all, it's getting to know people who you work with, let's say in an office setting. Who are they? Hmm. Mm. What are they about? Get to understand what they do well, you know, and, and appreciate them for that. They, they feel appreciated. They feel that you're interested in them. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you know sort of where their weaknesses are. So where do you put them in, in, on your team to where they can be most successful, to make the whole team together, to work together? Mm. How do you better integrate this team? For us... Um, a leader, when I talk about on the leader side, uh, is, is not about the leader, but it's about how well the team functions. And judge a leader not by his or her own performance, but how well does the team do. Mm. And so often we raise the leader and forget the team, when the team probably did 90% of the work. No doubt. And did the leader give them the courage? Did he give them the... Um, ways that they can become the best of who they are, that it comes together where they're synchronized in a way that they're all moving in the same direction. Mm, mm. And so courage plays an important role in relationships. And it may also be that you'll have to have some crucial conversations mm. with some people who may need to hear yeah. some things. And, and one of the big complaints I hear from most people, A, they don't get much feedback from people. And when it is, it's half-hearted, or they don't get it at all. And when they do, they feel like they're being beaten down. Mm. I don't think uh, feedback needs to be that way. And the other is that they're micromanaged. You know, someone will come in, and I'll take care of that, I'll do that, and the team doesn't develop. That takes courage for the leader not to be a micromanager. Absolutely. And to learn how to give constructive, helpful feedback. But yeah. anyway, that's another way to do it. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's so, it's really profound when you think about it, because I can tend to be a reductionist, as you and I have 
talked about yep. many a times. I love simplicity and clarity, minimalism. So I'm always prone to go, okay, these are the essentials. These are the underpinnings. It's reduced to these five. But one thing I often do once I do my reducing yeah. measure is that I always stand back and objectively try to be super critical. Like, is it really that simple? Can it really be reduced to that? Does that really encompass the full need? Does that really cover every base? And when I think of those five virtues, I am always, I, I always come back to like a sum total of it all equalizes. Hmm. You know, like it really, in, in present day, it takes a lot of courage to love. Some more so for others because they've been wounded, they've experienced yep. trauma, heartbreak. It takes courage to really open your heart again and say, I'm gonna give heart and soul to this person. It takes courage to execute tough love. Why? Because you don't wanna be rejected. You don't wanna be labeled as that guy. You don't want your motives to be sort of, um, uh, for lack of better term, you know, to be misconstrued or to wrongfully, you know, identify you. It takes courage to operate in integrity. It takes courage to stick to truth and hold the line and say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord, and yet we're going to stick out like a sore thumb and be labeled as Jesus freaks. It takes courage. It takes courage to really pursue truth in a world that's washed away everything and anything goes and everything's subjective and relative. It takes courage to... I'll tell you one, it takes courage for me to pursue excellence. Why? Because I carry a degree of insecurity. So my MO is to approach things half-hearted so as I don't get egg on my face. It like, and all of those things, it takes courage all the more. Here's what's, here's, here was my question. In a culture that doesn't value those virtues anymore. Mm, that's correct. And I think this is where more than ever, but by the way, when you were talking about talking with someone out of love or whatever, this is where courage, love, and relationships come together. Absolutely. So wow. it's a mix. It's just not they one, coalesce. but they're Absolutely. intertwined. And I think in, in the world today, one could say, in fact, I was talking to a person when I was working in the Ukraine a number of years ago. And I would just classified. have everybody know that 99% <laughs> of SIG's conversations have to remain veiled. They're always like, they have this mystique around them because he can't disclose names, settings, time frames. I love that. It's like watching this. It's like cinema. It's You're a like, spy movie over here. <laughs> <laughs> because it's all like these high tier, like high sort of, you know, I digress. And I'm the sorry. way that he describes them is very, it's it's impressively, I don't, I don't mean to um, call it theatrical, but it's so dramatic yes, in the sense yes. of like, I'm picturing myself in the in the conversation like, oh, this is intense. <laughs> like, this is crazy stuff. The whole planet could blow up if this <laughs> does not go right. <laughs> I'm like, don't tell me anymore that this right. is happening. Well, this one worker in, <laughs> yeah, work. in the Ukraine was saying, you know, the people that I, he was a guy probably 30 years old, and he was saying, you know, in the world I work, the kinds of things you're talking about, that's not what goes on with where I work. In fact, they probably do the opposite of all of them. Huh, right. So why should I, what do I do? Right. My answer was this, and it goes back to the subject mm. of courage. Here we go. This is where behaviors make a difference. Not, look at me, I'm so wonderful but rather you're consistent in what you talk about and the way you behave. Mm -hmm. You're not putting anybody down. You're, you're not uh, preaching that you ought to live this other way, but people are gonna watch you. Mm. And people are going to make their own conclusion about who you are and what you're about. And I will argue that others will say, hmm, I wonder what's going on with that guy or mm. that gal. And you may be able to only influence one or two people, but that's one or two more people than we've had before who 
instinctive sense that there is something built into the universe, built into the world we live in, that's healthy, that can bring the fullness of life, and this other stuff will not. Absolutely. And so that takes courage to live the humble life, the mm. generous life, the serving life. People will know, not by what you say, but what you do. So good. So good. You know, and, you know, the other day, you and I were having a conversation, Boots, as well, where we were talking about, um, I had spoken to, you know, that my son and I had a conversation recently in this political fury that now is our very present day. Um, he had asked me, are, are you a constitutionalist? And uh, I said, yes, yes, I am. I had asked him, by way of retort, are you? And he, he said, I am, I am. And you and I then were talking about that. And you said, you know, in present day, there's a lot of conversations surrounding the Constitution. Yep. Is it a growing document, an evolving document? Is it something that we should amend, change, yada, yada, yada? Wherein you said something so good where you said, you got to remember the underpinnings of the Constitution. It's less about that document and more about the virtues that gave birth to that document. Correct. That these virtues were the foundation in which that document came from. If you remove the virtues, then change the document all you want. It's untethered. It's untethered. It has no anchor. And when you think about those virtues of love and integrity and truth and excellence and relationships, they're the virtues that make any organization healthy, I would any agree. family, any job place, any person, any you know, collegiate institution, anything that's worth its salt has to be anchored to a moral compass that we know comes from Jesus, but yet we have worked overtime to altogether remove them. Yeah, and I think we think, well, the other ways will be better. And my answer is, look at the world today. Mm. And, and one of the things, if I have a dream, it would be this. That what in the end unites all people, whether they're different cultures, different backgrounds, different languages, different perspectives on life in this country, different parties, whatever. But if people can come together with a common set of virtues, like the five I talk about, and the courage to put them in effect, that if we get together to talk, one thing we do have in common is this moral base. And we know if we got together to talk about, and you came from different places, that we all have that common base, and there's a sense of trust. Because what they do bring is a sense of trust that we can begin to talk about issues. You may have a different view, and you may have a different view, and I do. But I believe that as you more that you talk, and we know we're working out of the same base compass, something will emerge. Mm. Mm. And I know it's a difficult world. And I know, you know the Jewish-Palestinian issue isn't new. It's been going on certainly since the 40s, if not earlier, uh, historically. And, and in, in, in those cases, you don't have the same base that they're operating out, and they don't trust each other. Right. How much has that happened in other places? So yeah. that's, my, that's my hope and prayer, that we can find something that can bring people together, unite people, instead of everyone going to their corner and the, let the fight begin. So good and so true. I, I, as we, as we near, near the end, I want to, uh, I don't know if you were prepared for this, but I, I still want to bring it up anywho. Um, and that is, you know, one of the things that I have witnessed in your life, it's, you know, when you talk to people um, over a lengthy tenure, there's always sort of that, as, as we spoke about, you know, weeks ago, we were talking about that convergence or that drum beat that's in somebody. It becomes almost their life manifesto. They may not know it until later in their years, but you hear this constant theme 
that always surfaces, no matter the conversation or season that they're in. This is indig This is like intrinsic in them. And one of the things that I've loved about you as a follower of Jesus, you have really ascribed to the mentality that I define like this, that you really see you can either make a point or you can make a difference. The follower of Jesus is called to make a difference. We live in a day and age right now where we are much too satisfied with just making a point because points you can make verbally. A difference is made over a period of time, largely by a lifestyle that's visible and tangible and chock full of integrity. Yep. It's, it's, it's what you said, it's the humble life, but the slow, methodical, intentional life that sticks out because it's a life that's driven by virtue. Yep. And you might not have the, the, the ability to simply just make your grandstand point, but you do lead a life that makes a clear difference in those that you affect, those that are entrusted to you, those that are watching you. And you speak to that in terms of, um, you sort of give the football analogy of many times Christians are trying to, they, they, they look at relationships certainly through an evangelistic lens, yes. we look at all relationships like all these relationships are in the red zone. So we're like, at the, you know, 10 yards to the end zone. That's there. We got to seal the deal, button this up, get them to, you know, confess their sins, receive Jesus, get them across the goal line. Wherein you said what the church has neglected detrimentally is we've neglected the 80 yards yes. or the 90 yards that we're responsible for to walk somebody to the red zone, to be that relationship that makes a difference because it's a relationship driven by virtues of where you slowly but methodically with the long view in mind going, I'm just going to be a shining light in this person's life that attracts them to Jesus. And I think as people move along in their own journey and get a better sense of who they are and who they're not and how these virtues might operate in their life, who know, only the Lord knows where all that will head. But if someone can move further down in the journey, they can make a difference wherever they are, whatever their background is, whatever they believe, but they can touch uh, other lives in a very constructive, positive way. Mm. And it may begin just in their own family, where there's been brokenness wow. or problems, or in their own small group somewhere, they can make a difference. Maybe a little further, they're in a part of a team somewhere, and that team comes together in a different kind of way because of the way people are operating and some commonality with them. All along, things are improving. Wow. And. I may be able to walk with someone a part of a journey, and then that day has concluded. Someone else comes along. In my life, there have been men in particular who've come along at different stages of my life and have had things to say, to give feedback, to encourage, to challenge, and I'm forever grateful for them. Mm. And so when I talk about people saying, you're not the same as that you were 30 years ago, all I can say, I give thanks for that. And you are right, but I've had people where I've learned along the way. And I must say that I'm always asking myself, how could I have done better? And sometimes to a detriment to myself. Yeah. I could never be a starting pitcher in the major leagues. I could never be a pitcher in them. <laughs> I could never be a pitcher. But say I was, say I was a pitcher. I could never hold a baseball. A <laughs> yeah, I don't know all that. But if I was a bat pitcher, boy. <laughs> but if I threw a ball and a guy hit the home run, five pitches later I'd be still thinking about the – how, how did he hit the home run? Uh. Well, you can't pitch that way. Uh. What did I learn from it? And I'm not throwing that pitch again, <laughs> but I'm still obsessed by it. Okay. That's something where I've got to grow. Uh, otherwise, I get stuck. Absolutely. You, you told a story uh, on Sunday when you were preaching about, um, and you didn't coin it like I just did with the football analogy. But you really told a story of when you were at Harvard, you shared um, 
you, sh you, were, you were in this sort of facility with a cohort, you all had your separate bedrooms, but yet you shared uh, space with this, uh, I guess he was from Pakistan? Yes. And where your sort of MO was, I'm just gonna be part of this guy's journey. Wherever God's leading him and wherever he winds up, I just wanna be that light. But you really, as you often do, you sort of itemized the elements of what it was to be a part of that 80 yards that just walked with him. And they were really sort of tangible, relational things. Can you, can you speak to those? Yeah, I think one is just listening to people, mm. asking questions, seeking to understand who they are, what's important for them, and why. At the same time, being authentic about yourself. And that, that in that process of listening, questioning, seeking to understand, and being authentic as to who you are in developing trust, mm. doors open in new kinds of ways. And for my friend, I learned a great deal, and I'm forever grateful. It opened my eyes to a lot of things I wouldn't have known otherwise. Wow. And so I, I, I think it's, in some ways it's simple, but it's extremely difficult. And you have to put away a, a your own perspectives, your own, I don't know about that. Let him or her tell you about why that's important for them and what goes on. Uh, I learned a lot about the Hajj. I learned a lot about Islam. And I'm forever grateful for him for being able to share it. Now, he had questions for me, but it opened a door for us to begin to talk about other things. Mm. But I think just a willingness to walk alongside somebody and having and treating them as though they are valued. Mm. That's good. That, that, I have one last question as we get ready to wrap, um, and it might be a similar answer to what you just said, so that's okay if that's the case. Um, but one of the one of the lines from the book that stood out to me, correct me if I get it off slightly, um, but it's leadership is not about you, but it starts with you. Mm. So for the person who's listening to this episode and they find you know the virtues compelling and they think to themselves, you know I really need to to cherish and and um, demonstrate these things in my own life, or maybe they're a Christian and they're like. I need to get more involved in the 80 yards. Um, what would be a simple step in that direction you would suggest to them? Well, we talk a lot about behaviors, or I talk a lot about behaviors in the book. And I think it's just taking one of those virtues, coming to understand it. Hmm. And, and the book will outline some behaviors associated with it. And how am I, how, how can I start working on those? Just from a behavior point of view. And I, I want to, I'm going to try that, see what happens, maybe just in a small way. Yeah. So it's a way to begin. And without a plug, well, it'll be a plug for the Severn Leadership Group. <laughs> uh, I can say that uh, our, we have, a, I think, a uh, program. It's about transforming people. Mm. It's not, I'm going to give you six skills and you're going to be out the door. But we hope that transforming stuff that you can do every day in your life, there'll be a mentor to walk along with you. And our mentors are not telling you stories of the past, but our mentors are asking questions, seeking to understand, challenging and encouraging you so that you, you can walk in a more authentic way yourself. And uh, our president and team, uh, Julie Campbell, who's our president, do really a great job. And it's a program that's like four and a half months long. Yeah. It's not, well, two weeks, you've got it, you're done. Totally. But remember, I said it's a lifelong journey, mm. and you can become a part of a network of people around the world that are there to walk with you whenever you need it. Yeah. Absolutely. That's awesome. You know, as, as we close, this is, that's, that's the third number, time we've said it. <laughs> number three. <laughs> he just I, wants to have the last word. That's <laughs> all. <laughs> well, Mike Hogg. Um, you know, one of the things that I couldn't help feeling while reading your book and considering these virtues is that I, I'm, I'm tempted to go, well, 
and I, I just said it a few moments ago, we live in a culture that no longer values those virtues. Yeah. So no wonder there's so much chaos and you almost see the opposite of every single one of them. You almost see more hate than you do love. You almost see, you know, more deception than integrity, more lies than you do truth, more, you know, sort of quiet quitting or bare minimum, you know, or self-refinement. You don't see that. You see uh, sort of, you know, the opposite. And you don't see courage any longer. No. You see insecurity. And yet, I'm, I, I sort of am prone as a leader to go, then what's the use? What's, what's the use if we live in a culture or society that doesn't value these virtues? What's the use in really trying to champion them? And I just felt like, hey, whether it was the spirit quickened within me or just uh, an aha, you're such a dummy moment, it's because they refine me. Yes. And as the city on the hill whose light cannot be hidden, as the salt and light of the earth that Jesus called me to be, these virtues are not negotiable. They're essential. Yes. And they're essential in my own personal refinement and they truly do. You said it earlier. They make a difference in the world around me. You said even if you affect one or two, that's one or two more than would not have been affected. And so I am so grateful for this work. I'm so grateful for you as a mentor and uh, just the way that you model these. This isn't theory to you. This is practice. No, and I, and I think you raised a good question. With the world around us, why bother? I say two things. One, it allows you to discover who you really are mm. and live a purposeful life, not scattered. But you discover more of who you are, what you're about. You live a purposeful life. And at the same time, despite the chaos surrounding you and the world we live in, there can be an inner peace Amen. as to mm. yourself and that you are fulfilling your purpose and calling. Amen. That's worth everything. Even with the chaos, there is something quieting on the inside. Come on. Mm. Mic drop. <laughs> Thank you for being here, sir. It's been Always a... my pleasure to be with the two of you. Oh. Thank you so much. The pleasure is ours. Most certainly. Thank you so much for tuning in, either watching this episode or listening on Spotify, Apple. Go ahead and check us out on Instagram at Simplexity Podcast. And of course, check out the book, The Virtue Proposition. Where any, wherever, <laughs> where books are sold, Amazon <laughs> and the like. That's right. Love you guys. <laughs>